What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations, and I'm the host of Epic Conversations, 2020 Best Podcast News Award winner, 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. Also, I co-host and co-produce the only online show in the world for dads and fathers that is sponsored by Dove Men Plus Care and being part of that team over 2022 and 2021 reached out directly and indirectly to over 100,000 fathers around the world. So as always, I'd like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. And welcome everyone who's watching live or on the replay. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the Dr. Vibe Show on YouTube and on Facebook and on LinkedIn, wherever you're watching it. But especially on YouTube, if you subscribe, also hit the notification bell. That will tell you and give you information on when upcoming epic conversations happen. So you know what we like to do here. We love talking and having people come on and share, but also we like to have new friends on. So we have two new friends with us tonight from the Black Physicians Association of Ontario. So let me give you a background about the organization then a little background on our two friends that are coming on. So the Black Physicians of Ontario, the BPAO, is the most established organization of Black physicians in Canada, and it will be hosting its 14th annual health symposium in Toronto on February 25th, 23, so in a few days' time. The annual event brings together physicians from across Ontario with an opportunity to hear from respected speakers, engage in important discussions about health, and meet with medical peers from the Black community. So we have two people. We got the heavy hitters from the BPAO tonight. We have Andrew, who is a family physician, Dr. Andrew Thomas, who is a family physician who works in the Durham region. He is originally from Whitby, Ontario. He attended Howard University. And that's another thing that him and I have in common. My dad is a graduate of Howard University. And just a little trivia for those who may know the name, when he went to Howard University, one of his teachers was the late Tony Morrison. Just a little, little little trivia there. Then he went to Howard University for medical school, participating in mentorship and training opportunities through the BPO, motivated him to return to Canada pr to practice medicine. And we're happy to have him back. He served as co-lead for the Black Health Vaccine Initiative Clinic in Durham, a co-lead in the SMART Initiative, and is the chair of the BPAO board. And Shanai has led international and community development for nonprofits in the sub-Saharan Africa. What? The Caribbean and North America. She's the executive director of the BPAO and is happy to support Black Youth Service, Black, Black Youth Success, sorry, and, and rituals for discovery. She has extensive experience in research, leadership development, education, economic development, and nonprofit management. Wonder if she sleeps. My goodness. In her spare time, she is involved. She has spare time. Really? In her spare time, she's involved with projects for Rotary International and sits on boards, including the Meta Center. Her current work in anti Black racism and public health inspired her to serve in the Born Health Equity Advisory Group. Wow. I I'm really, I'm just humbled to even just get either of these people on because they're just doing everything, they got it all going on. So we have them both coming on tonight, sharing about a number of different things. So got Andrew, Shanai, they're in the house. Hi. Hey, what's Thank going you. on? Happy to be here. Good. Good. Evening, everybody. Happy Black History Month, there 365. <laughs> all right, all right, right. How's the day been for both of you? Oh uh, well, well, well. So, little little disclaimer: Shania's had a day. <laughs> All right, we've been told she's had a day. So, we're gonna be a little bit easy on her because she's had a day, right? Okay. So, we're looking forward to chatting and having a lovely conversation about a number of things. I'm, I know we'll get in, uh, have a conversation about the upcoming event on Saturday. Um, also, some of the community work the general health and wellness you do, and all the supporting of Black doctors and physicians. But our family would like to find a little bit more about both of you. So like an old Queen Latifah song, we like to say ladies first. Shanai? <laughs> <Got you. laughs> Andrew, you didn't even have to volunteer me this time. <laughs> all right. All right. So 
great bio on you, Shania. Can you share a little bit more about yourself? About myself, I am a daddy's girl, originally from Zimbabwe, um, just above South Africa, because most people don't know where that is. Um, I speak uh, Shona in English. I come from a diversity studies background, I'd say predominantly. And I would say my calling is that all people will reach self-actualization early on in life if possible. Um, so right now I get to do that in all of my work and all of my volunteering. I'm a Rotarian service above self. That's, that's me. Wonderful. Andrew, follow up. Thank you. What should I say? So <laughs> I, <laughs> that was, that was a good, uh, a good intro. Thanks. And I, <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, um, as doc, as you said, you know, I'm, I'm a family doc, um, and I guess I'm a, a family doc as most family docs of my generation are, I have sort of lots of different side hustles. You know, I, I do a little bit of uh, long-term care. I, I have a family practice. I do some coroner, you know, actually the list goes on and on. Um, but you know, I went to Howard and then it was super important to come back to Durham and be close to family got lots of uh, brothers and sisters in the area. Um, and uh, my wife and my parents, my, my parents are in Jamaica right now. They winter there and they're, they're called, they had called me to ask me how I can set up my dad's uh, Fitbit. So <laughs> I was nervous, but it was just the Fitbit. <laughs> so yeah, things are good. Background is Jamaican, but um, yeah. Born, born and raised um, in Toronto and living in Durham region. Excellent. Would like to get from each of you your journey on becoming a physician. Because before we went live, Shania said, so why do you do what you do? So I'm going to so Shania, I'd like to find out when did you decide to become a physician and why oh. you're a physician? I am not a physician. Oh. Um, I am a physician adjacent, Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I manage, I manage the physician association, sure. uh, but I always joke and tell Andrew at this point, I might get an honorary, <laughs> honorary <laughs> physician's degree because of all the work we do. Uh, my mother is a nurse by training. She then transitioned into banking. Um, wow, but I think that's interesting. Yes. Cause I mean, before we had independence in Zimbabwe, you could be a nurse, a teacher, or a maid. Those are your options. Um, and then after independence, my mom decided, let me get into banking, and she worked in the central bank. Um, but I think that sense of that hospitality that is there, that service, um, doctors and people in healthcare are just people who are like naturally self-sacrificial. So I really love being able to work with them. I'll say I always had like small public health sort of projects I've worked on before, uh, but specifically with BPAO, what led me there, other than being recruited, is obviously just my passion for, you know, like I say, helping us as a people be a bit more self-actualized, but also the work in anti-Black racism, the work in increasing access, health equity, like, yeah, that, that I can do any day. So that's why I'm there. Okay. And sorry, I, I'm sorry for saying that you were a physician. I thought you were. <laughs> oh, no worries. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Now, I know Andrew is one, so we need we got to get that story down, say, mm -hmm. that, what was the journey and why? Yeah. You know, I, um, I always, speaking about my mom, my mom was a pharmacist, now retired. And um, so, you know, being in healthcare was always something that I was interested in doing. Um, wasn't 100% sure what until later in life. Um, the rest of my family say that uh, as my mom rocked me in the cradle, she would whisper in my ear, you're going to be a physician. <laughs> you're going to be a physician. So I had no choice. No, but it, it's honestly, it's been the, the best thing. And certainly like... Um, uh, you, you know, really a passion of mine for the last number of years. Um, so ultimately, you know, I went through undergrad and, um, uh, you know, go th going through high school and then into undergrad, um, really still with the idea of being interested in, you know, serving patients and helping people. Um, I ended up doing a master's in, in public health. 
Um, and that really kind of made me lean more towards wanting to do more on an individual level, you know, working directly with patients, um, worked for a bit doing some work in smoking cessation, and then uh, was able and successful in getting into Howard, where I did my four years of medical school down there. So yeah, it's definitely been, you know, I can't, some people say they definitely from the day one, they felt that they were going to be physicians. For me, I knew I wanted to be in healthcare in some degree, and that kind of evolved over time um, with a little bit of encouragement from, from family, I think, down the road. Why did you choose Howard? Yeah. So um, my brother, he went to another historically black college in Chicago. He's 10 years older. He actually went on a sports athletic scholarship. And uh, so I was aware of the opportunity to study down in the States and aware of historically black colleges. So, you know, when I was applying, I always had this idea that, yeah, you know, I can look outside of Canada. Um, it's, it's funny, I think, um, you know, whenever I tell people I went to Howard, um, they're like, that's amazing. You know, what was that experience like? And it certainly was an amazing experience. I think I don't have any regret. The one thing I, I sometimes think back upon now is the fact that, um, y- you know, my everyone's, you know, they say like your, your journey to blackness is all a little bit different, right? Your, 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 your journey to wokeness. Uh, for the black people, essentially, you know, and I might have been a little bit later in that, you know, it was it wasn't till I got to Howard and was in Howard that I then realized how important doing this type of work is. And so, you know, I went to Howard and I soaked it up, was involved in clubs, you know, took in the experience being surrounded by other black physicians and and black patients and everyone in the hospital was black. Um, but when I look back now, I'm like, you know, that was really, really cool. But I only really realized sort of after the fact, after having been at Howard and realizing, you know, how important it is to be in that type of environment. You know, growing up in in Whitby, Ontario, not the most diverse place. And it's really only in retrospect, you know, I kind of went through at a time where like, I, I didn't have anything horribly happen to me overtly, you know, but when I look back, especially after being at Howard, I realized you know, hmm, you probably did go through quite a bit, actually. Um, and, um, you know, had a lot of learning essentially at Howard. So it was a lot of uh, fortunate that I ended up there. Um, and in retrospect, it was a super great opportunity. Um, I think if I were to like have gone now, I would have been so much more starstruck <laughs> having been there. But certainly, um, you know, it was uh, a fantastic experience. I wish everyone could have. I mean, going to school in the States is a little bit expensive. But other than that, (laughs) an experience I think everyone should have. Uh, Before I come back to Shania, I want to ask you then, what brought you back? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's tempting, um, you know, once you do, especially in, in medicine, you know, when you spend any time there, it is tempting to stay. I mean, unfortunately, you know, their healthcare system has a lot of challenges and we could spend many hours discussing that. But um, as someone like as a physician, um, you know, the money they spend on healthcare opens up a lot of opportunities um, for just lots of fancy things that, you know, we may not have the same level of access to here. I think the American healthcare system is like, you know, do everything possible for an individual if you have insurance. Um, whereas here we have definitely more of a, you know, um, a sort of a, a broader perspective and treating the whole population. So there's a lot of investments that go into unique um, niche things in the States. And so it's it's an exciting place to be. Not that Canada isn't too, but a lot of people who go down there end up staying there. Ultimately, you know, family was super important to come back and be here. Um, and then also, you know, I did feel that it would be nice to have some impact being back at home and I've been able to, you know, kind of work and live back essentially where I grew up, which is super cool. Um, I went to, uh, you know, where I did my training, uh, as a family medicine resident was where my mom took me to, you know, grade nine, take your student to work day. Um, so that was kind of cool to go full circle. (laughs) 
Very nice. Good stuff. Shanae, I gave you a break. So coming back to you, what brought you to be part of BPAO? What's the story there? Well, I think when they had a recruiter reach out, for me, it was um, it was obviously just the interest, right, in the public health potential. Um, I loved, like when I was reading about them, just the history, the wealth of knowledge of what's happened before. I think BPAO used to be called Abyss <laughs> in, in the 80s. And the, the physicians who founded BPAO also then went on to also, you know, found places like Taipu Community Health Center. So it wasn't just a collection of doctors, it's literally doctors who are connected to community and really care about community. I mean, in many places, um, people don't talk about doctors as people who care about the patient as a whole person. And I think that's not true for our physicians. Our members are so involved, so plugged in. I mean, we have some in Ottawa, doing like free wellness days for people without OHIP. Like you, you don't have to even question uh, why they get up in the morning. And so for me being part of all that, being plugged into all of that and trying to enable them, but also have a more enabling environment for those coming after them. I think that was, it was an easy sell. Um, I, I am not exaggerating when I say that the work that BPAO does um, is definitely not just shifting the face of healthcare in Ontario, but th the health ecosystem because <laughs> we're in all these different places of influence as well. Yeah. Andrew, what brought you to BPO, BPAO's doorstep? Yeah, I um, you know, I <laughs> I told Tanai before, you know, so <laughs> kind of funny, I guess. Like, I it's almost as if I had no choice you know it's just <laughs> okay. all these different interactions okay. over time like you know when i was in undergrad at the university of toronto my landlord um who is and was you know has been a long-standing member of bpao told me you're coming to this event i didn't know what it was <laughs> you know she promised me a good lunch and so i came and um, now I realize I went to the symposium back in wow. whatever that was, you know, 2010 or 11 or something like that. And um, she at that point had told me, like, you should go to medical school in Washington. I had no idea what she was also talking about, you know, like, OK, Washington State, Seattle. Awesome. Cool. And then here we go. Also, I look back, I ended up at Howard as well. She's probably like um, maybe some sort of profit or something just for yeah. the future. But, you know, it actually was, there are some challenges navigating a new system, you, you know, so, so from heading from the U.S. back to Canada. And uh, in particular, um, you know, we'll probably talk about this more, right? Like a lot of black physicians, as we, you know, are well aware, um, uh, face a lot of um can face discrimination um, in coming back and practicing. So sort of at all levels. So I knew I had to be like better than everyone else to get the spot that I wanted. Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we, we bear that extra pressure just being a black position. And so I, I reached out to a number of members at the time who helped to, you know, work on my letter of reference or my personal statement. Um, we did lots of mock interviews. They, um, actually plugged me in with some um, opportunities to volunteer to kind of get my feet wet back in the Ontario system. And so, you know, lo and behold, ended up back in my, um, in, in, you know, back at home essentially. And, uh, you know, just really felt that, you know, you just can't like have to reach back and help out and ended up essentially, be, you know, working my way. I was sort of just involved in some committees and was for the, the vice president for a couple of years. And then, uh, the president when our, our past president um, retired, or retired her throne. So yeah, just a lot of different things over time ended up uh, bringing me to where I am now. Excellent. Is that person who sort of was this prophet, are they still around today? Are they still with us? So I, um, I saw her at a couple of conferences ago. Nice. Uh, I, I'm sure still kicking her out. Hope, maybe I'll see her on Saturday. <laughs> fantastic fantastic yeah. for those who are watching live on the replay I actually have the the front page of the website up on the screen so that's what it looks like and i'll certainly put the url address up momentarily but leading into this and there's a question here from uh, roger dundas 
who him and his dear wife Camille run buyblocks.com, Black Canada's number one online magazine. And I uh, I was gonna ask next, you know, what does BPAO do? And this question came up. So what does the BPAO do? And also do they assist in black Canadian families to get family doctors? Ladies first. <laughs> You're so wow. big <laughs> okay. So <laughs> so that that is singularly the question we are asked the most um, about obviously having like a, you know, a, almost, I guess, like a black family doctor directory. Yeah. Um, I would say that we are not yet at a point to do that because we do need more members. Unfortunately, I think we need a whole lot more members to be able to do that service. Um, primary care physicians are a bit overloaded and a lot of people end up being on the wait list. So the usual answer is, First, we'd look at, I mean, we have partners like uh, BHPN that are now looking into building up a, a more fulsome directory. Uh, but we're was working in the back end to try and get a bit more of a sense of where the rest of the Black physicians are. I mean, they only make up about 2.7% of the physician population in Ontario. So it's still just, you know, if you think of the level of need and the number of doctors that are there, we're not yet there. Uh, but on the more sort of future long-term side, the work we do with the, the medical schools uh, through the Network for the Advancement of Black Medical Learners, uh, we are trying to push that the number of Black physicians coming out of those programs increases. Um, and also we're trying to work on accelerated bridging for IMG physicians as well, right? There are a lot of people um, in the country that should be physicians but aren't because of some of these system barriers that we work day and night to fight and, and end. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute. What what are some of the barriers that are facing from your both your lenses mm -hmm. more black representation when it comes to physicians, whether it's Ontario or across the country? Andrew, I think you should start this one and then I can <laughs> sure. You know, um, and it kind of aligns with all the work that uh, BPAO does. So part of our work is with uh, in the pre-medical space. So if you think about, um, there's so many projects that we've worked on in that area, but just one in particular was a project called uh, Price of a Dream, which was just looking at all the costs associated with not studying medicine, but just applying to medical school. It's expensive to to apply and it's it's much more competitive than it ever has been. Um, and so working with some of our partners, um, you know, thinking about the idea of a fee waiver for, you, you know, um, black students to be able to kind of cut some of the costs there, you know, thinking about admissions at medical school, you know, um, wasn't too long ago, I think it was in, in 2016 that one of our BPAO members who's now a resident physician was the only black medical student at university of Toronto. Wow. You know, there was only one in her year. And, wow. Yeah. And she was valedictorian after all that. I'm going to say. But nice. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. University of Toronto is a, you know, huge medical um, school class and uh, you know, we've been able to work with them and they've done a lot of great work too, just to, you know, not really revolution, you know, nothing crazy, right? Just put black representation on these admission committees. You know, it's crazy to think, you know, okay, well, you know, let's just have a few black faces, you know, on a committee. And now they're looking at 20 plus black medical students per year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you go all the way through, okay, some of the things that I went through, right? Um, applying to, to residency. Uh, still in this, in this country, a lot of it is who you know, um, more so than what you can do. Uh, and then, you know, if, you know, my, my name blends in, right. Andrew Thomas, you know, all the time, my patients who I've met over the phone or virtually, you know, they're shocked to see me in real life, but you know, at every step of, of the way in the process, right. Um, by your experiences, by your volunteer opportunities, they know who you are. And if you don't look like the establishment, you, of course, there's the implicit bias there. You know, and sorry to there's, there's just so many you know <laughs> areas to address when yeah. it comes to well, representation. That's, well, that's one of the reasons I said beforehand. You, you, when this is not a one and done, so if you ever want to come back, and I think it's a very important subject, not only for 
the physician environment, but just general, I, I'd love you to come back and we can have a, a more fuller conversation about that because people need to know. Yeah. You know, the, 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 just the last bit I'll talk about too. And then of course, um, the challenges as being, being in practice, right. You know, um, we had done a study, um, and I think it was in 2019, um, of our members and, um, more than 70% had indicated that, you know, they had experienced, um, racism just based on, you know, the color of their skin. And these are trainees and, and physicians in practice. And so, you think about, we, there's been a lot of talk about uh, burnout um, mm. in, in healthcare, whether it's in primary care or, or otherwise. And so when we think about, okay, yes, we have, you know, black physicians, but um, are they able to continue to work to the same level? Um, what were, what are the fields that they are working in? And, and so part of our organization is, yes, we want to, we, we host these things, you know, we bring black physicians together. We know that um, being connected is super important. This is why we're, you know, so excited about our conference on Saturday. It's the first in real life again after doing a couple virtually. Um, but being able to connect uh, is huge. I take it for granted going to Howard, you know, where, you know, so many of my classmates were black. But for for some physicians, if you come from Whitby or Bowmanville, you you know, unless you're at this conference, <laughs> you've, you've never been in a room like this. And wow. so... You know, many, many factors as to the, the disparities that we see in healthcare, And, and just the last bit, you know, about I agree with uh, Chennai, you know, we really are hoping to get to a point where we have, you know, like uh, we we found all the black physicians out there in the province. We, they, they know the good word about what we do. You know, they've joined our membership. And then, you know, then we'll probably be able to at some point, you, you know, in collaboration with our partners, be able to um better serve the needs of some black patients who are looking for a provider who looks like them because we know that it has impacts on health. Um, I just anecdotally, you know, when you see my practice in Bowmanville, I've actually had patients who come from around the province, more or less, who wow. see me, you know, they'll, you know, go to our website and say, oh, okay, and then they'll call my clinic. You know, I want to see this guy because it's, it's, it's important for people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so um, my, my patient practice is maybe a little bit more diverse than the next. And it's been a fantastic opportunity, but it also aligned it sort of with the time of me opening my practice. I think so many black docs, especially in family medicine, are, you know, really, really um, stretched and full rostered. Um, but it's, it's certainly a goal that we like to be able to have because we know how important it is for patients. Okay. Shania. Uh, I don't know if Andrew didn't cover it all, but what other things does the organization do that we should know about? Well, I mean, I, I, I talked about Enable earlier, which is, I guess, more the academic education side of things. Uh, it's a critical program because it's you're, you're getting deans and EDI leaders to say we're supporting, you know, more anti-Black racist work. Um, in medical schools and curriculum and all these things like Andrew's covered. But we also have a community uh, facing lens. Um, during the pandemic, uh, our partnership with the Black Health Alliance, um, we started what uh, I think you mentioned it in Andrew's bio, the Black Health Vaccine Initiative. And initially what had happened was that just started with just the instant let's react to what's actually happening in black community with the pandemic that we're not getting the same level of care and prioritization let's fight for that and let's also have black doctors be visible and talking to patients about their concerns about vaccines and everything else um, and therapeutics it then sort of transitioned once we got to a place of okay vaccines have happened and some level of supports happen we actually need to now think about recovery and rejuvenation after this, because the pandemic, I always say, is collective trauma that we still, I don't think we've ever fully realized the, the impact, right? I mean, we saw a Black community was um, almost like double or triply affected as far as fatalities um, through COVID. And this is research that only came later on. So I always say, I think if BHVI didn't exist, I don't know what the situation might have actually looked like. So there's a lot of that community response energy. Uh, now it's morphed into the Black Health Wellness Initiative. And so what we do is a combination of, I mean, one of the things we had was also Black Vax Facts, which was a partnership with Scarborough Health Network, where people could pretty much 
call in or, or, or email and ask questions of a black doctor. So even though, like I said, we don't have the resources to be able to have everyone have black family doctors, people could ask questions, right? And at our wellness fairs, we make sure our members are present and they're able to sort of answer cl clinical questions. Uh, but I think one of the big things that have happen in the wellness clinics and the wellness fairs is you get lots of questions about how do I advocate as a patient? Um, what do I need to know about cancer and all these other diseases that, you know, disproportionately affect our community? Um, so BHWI has a many, many different arms of intervention. Um, at the symposium, we, we, we might talk a bit about it, but we do also have Black Health Talks. So every month we are looking at topics about what is something that is affecting our community that we need black doctors to speak into. So we've covered some uh, around hypertension. Um, and I think because it presents a lot in black, in black men, Dr. David Esho spoke about that. The last one, we sort of like combined it with, you know, Valentine's day and looking at relationships and more sort of like mental health um, mm -hmm. looking themes. We have one coming up with one of our um, board members, actually, Dr. Majula Mole, talking about more of the breast cancer screening. She's part of an amazing initiative wow. as well called Stage Zero, wow. where you know black women get, basically get to put on um, almost like a prosthetic, like a um, a bra that would look like what your natural breast would look like, so you know what all the stages of cancer look like on on your breast. Just, really innovative uh, ways to look at things. And uh, we also do fund a bit of sort of a member projects in community as well. Um, there is Choices that's looking at, you know, the hypertension in, in patients at Taibu. Uh, DICE is a diversity and inclusion in cardiology education project. Uh, we look at, we support mentorship of physicians. We're doing a lot of things. I get tired <laughs> of talking about this sometimes. Yeah, you're not kidding, you need resources, wow. <laughs> We need resources, wow. but it's because there's that much. Um, need, because when you're looking at you know social determinants of health, we're just going to present in so many ways. And so we just, we need black physicians at the table. That's why we need more members. We need uh, more connections. Uh, just a thanks to Ontario Health and Public Health Agency Canada who have connected with us about things we could do on a system end, but more is needed, more work is needed. Yeah. Okay, wow. There's just what you said is just so overwhelming, but so needed. Um, I, I'm before we get to the symposium, and I know you've talked about it both from both your lenses, though. How has the environment for Black physicians changed since the pandemic? Yeah, you know, I think the a really another important. Um, change was the murder of George Floyd. Um, you know, from, I'll speak from our organization's perspective. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of partners with many different organizations from government to, you know, the regulatory agencies that um, regulate physicians. We have, you know, corporate partners and things like that. Um, but certainly, um, you know, unfortunately, but it really took that, that event, um, to, to really change the conversation and, you know, before more so than I think than at any other time and to know, I connect me if I'm wrong, we, we were reached out to, um, often for input and consultation about, you know, what, what needs to be done, um, regarding, um, supporting black physicians or black health in general. Um, and that was layered on top of the pandemic, of course. And so, you know, I think right away, um, being a physician organization and, you know, all the things that Shania mentioned, you know, we're, we're small, you know, small, but mighty, you know, um, it would sound like we've got thousands of members, but as you heard, right, like we're underrepresented in the province. So, um, there's few of us. So we, we had to turn inward first, you know, and make sure that we supported our members. And we did that in different ways, just connecting healing cir circles, you know, just sort of making sure that we were doing well, cause it was a challenging time. Um, but you know, we seized opportunity, right. You know, 
people were willing to listen, you know, we took that and we said, mm -hmm. okay, you know, let's, um, if you really actually want to support the work we do, um, support us. And so that we were able to get um, funding and, and we use that opportunity um, to be able to really promote black health um, and also, um, you know, supporting physicians. So really there's been a huge change, um, you know, 2020 to now, um, unfortunately driven by those two, you know, awful events. And, and there's many more that still happen, but um, that certainly was a major turning point. And it's allowed us to do a lot more. Um, you know, it's unfortunately through those circumstances, but we really, we, we, we knew that we had to capitalize on this crucial moment to be able to do the work we're doing. Shania, anything you want to add to what? You're on mute. Andrew? No, I'm not. Oh, I'm here. Shania? Maybe we lost her audio. I think she may have lost her audio for a moment because I, you can hear me okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when, while we're getting her back, I would like to say, so let's tr transition to what's happening on Saturday. Yeah. So uh, your the symposium, uh, can you give us a little background on uh, this event before we get to the actual event on Saturday? Yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's been, I guess we've been around, yeah, for a while in different iterations, the VPAO. And, um, you know, this primarily, this type of event came out of an opportunity for, yeah, Black physicians to get together. You know, there's good food, as I said before, an opportunity to socialize. Um, and then, you know, so importantly, now we are able to offer physicians, you know, some, uh, some medical education. Uh, so that's always been a huge part of the conference. And so that's evolved. You know, we've uh, continued to um, really grow the conference over time. This is the 14th annual. And um, yeah, you know, we, we traditionally would, would have had it at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. This is the first time we're doing it at U of T at the Dalalana School of Public Health. Um, and like I said, we had a couple of years which we were virtual. Um, different but you know we're so excited to be to be back in person um we always have a keynote speaker i think dr wharton has been our keynote speaker before uh but super excited to have him again um you know a, a super passionate speaker uh, an expert when it comes to obesity medicine and super topical because i mean you know obesity has always been um an issue that affects all po populations and you know there's um, disparities there as well but there's been a lot of talk especially recently about you know some of the new therapeutics and medications that are available so i think it's gonna be a really exciting talk to kind of start things off uh, we always have our annual general meeting as well during the conference sort of the the meat of things where we'll be able to you know um, vote on many of the different things you know we have elections we vote on many um bylaws that kind of keep our organization running and uh then we're going to cap it off with uh with a social event towards the end to really kind of uh keep the theme of like getting together and networking um uh yeah going strong through the whole event okay shanai was having some technical issues can you hear us now shanai yes i can all right you're awesome. back fantastic <laughs> the good stuff so so uh your, your partner in crime just did a wonderful job talking about Saturday, but I know you have stuff to add. So from your lens, um, what may, what is going to make or what makes Saturday special? Because it's probably, it's probably the first in-person one you've done in a while. So what is what are you excited about in regards to this big event coming up on Saturday? So, you know, one of the things, one of the hard things of the work we do is because of our visibility uh, with residents, we get a lot of, you know, we hear about, you know, just residents who are going through things, whether they're, you know, they're struggling with their program, um, they feel like they're being oppressed in different ways, you know, just, I think like what uh, Andrew was talking about early on about implicit uh, bias. And for some of them, they're alone, right, in the programs that they're doing. So when they get to come and see amazing heavy hitters, like, you know, 
all these people were published a lot. Sean Wharton talking about um, obesity and diabetes. And mind you, this is work that's inspired by being able to help community. Um, I think something just lights up in them. I think there is a an encouragement that like this is, you know, what you're going through right now, it's not permanent. And this is what it looks like when you get to the finish line. Um, and also even just that inspiration of doing certain work. I get residents who tell me, you know, I, I'm, you know, before their residents, actually, I think that'll be when they're still mid-student phase talking about they don't know what specialization they want, you know, but they know areas they're passionate about. So imagine them coming Saturday, you've got 150, 200 people and everyone is doing amazing work. Um, I would wow. say, you know, quite a percentage of the attendees is, is mid-students, right? It's mid-students and it's a couple of residents, um, but the bulk of it will be members already doing this amazing work. Uh, so I think there's going to be just that awestruck, the starstruck uh, feeling that Andrew was talking about. I know that's going to be there. We've had just mind-blowing keynotes. I mean, our directors of um, Continuing Professional Development, uh, it's, it's an accredited event, um, have always made sure they curate some of the most like off-the-time topics with some of the most innovative research, learnings, approaches. DICE, which I mentioned earlier, is going to be talking about that project, you know, inclusion in cardiology education. Like, what is that? Right? Yeah. So I think anyone who's there is lucky to be there. I don't think anyone would ever go there and be like, I didn't learn anything interesting. I mean, I remember even last year, it was virtual, but to me, it was just mind blowing the things ordinary people are doing in their work in healthcare to change the world. Um, so I'm excited for Saturday. That is our, Stop. that's our best, our best moment. And also black joy. We have a social from four to 6 PM and, you know, Physicians love that. Our members tell us time and time again that even just that socializing, networking, that getting together is is necessary for their wellness. Um, so for me, I love seeing that as well. Excellent. Uh, I always like to ask this question when events like this are being put on. How much work has it taken to make this a reality, especially coming from a virtual event now going back to face to face. When did you start the work to make Saturday a reality? <laughs> Andrew, Andrew, you've got the history. I mean, just to say it's our 14th one. So this is, I already know we're looking at 14 years. <laughs> but uh, but what I'm asking is just, this was this a first face to face one in years and like all the mm. planning because it was something that was taken away from you you had no control, now bringing it back to face-to-face. -to -face, how much work has it taken to get it back to face-to-face? -to -face? Um, I have it on good authority that our <laughs> director of CPD puts in at least a uh, hundred odd hours in getting this event together in general. Um, there's a lot that comes into getting accredited, um, and even having to work with sort of like the CPD departments at, at Temerty, there are a lot of meetings. We do 9 p.m. meetings <laughs> sometimes uh, just to plan it out because, you know, physicians are really busy. Um, mm -hmm. So there is some blood, sweat and tears uh, that that goes into creating it. But it's worth it, given what I've said. Like, that is our favorite day of the year, for sure. <laughs> So anything you want to add to that, Andrew, about, about, around the planning of this back-to-face-to-face -to -face event? Yeah, you know, we take a little bit of time off after it's done, and then we start planning again for the next wow. year. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, lots wow. of little moving parts, especially to, you know, get the accreditation, make sure we have, you know, top-notch speakers. Uh, and then, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll admit, you know, being a physician, as soon as you're dealing with physicians and trying to lock down schedules and make sure people are available, it's always challenging. Oh, that must be a lot of fun. That must be a lot of fun. What, what would make a successful symposium to each one of you this year? Ooh. Um, well, for me, I think definitely if everyone's able to make it, if as many of our members are able to make it, um, and as many black physicians that aren't members yet who don't know about us, if they could make it, I think that would be 
just gold because you know we're trying to to connect with them as much as possible it's hard to find them and so if they can find us that to me is more than a win okay. andrew i would agree and um you know we we also um you know community members as well you know we've had um partners whether it's from government or again corporate uh partners who yeah everyone will take away something you know um and i remember distinctly at the last conference we had in person uh there was a, a family doc i think he was from barry and he you know you could just see like kid on christmas morning right just like eyes <laughs> wide like what, there are other black docs around like this is amazing you know people just leave feeling kind of uh rejuvenated you know it's i think you know i've attended so many other conferences i can speak freely because i'm not a neurologist i went to a neurology conference as a medical student and that conference told me right away that i'm not going to be a neurologist ouch um <laughs> you know when you don't feel like you fit into a space <laughs> ouch. you know <laughs> okay no offense to any black yeah. neurologists out there, yeah. of course. Yeah. <laughs> but um, this was sort of the, you, you know, this massive conference, you know, we were in Philadelphia and, you know, this is well before the days of thinking about anti-black racism uh, in healthcare. Uh, I, I can say that I'm, I'm a young person, um, so relatively speaking. But um, yeah, you know, people feel comfortable, right? You can let down your guard, you, you know, you're at home, essentially. So I think a lot of people feel that and they go home and, you know, it gives you the boost till, uh, till the next year, but we're going to be doing a lot more events anyways through the year. So Good. won't be a Good big stuff. gap like previous. I know that you're focusing this event to the black physician. Is there value for those who are not part of the profession who are black to attend? And if there is, why would they, what would be their value in attending? Um, as someone who's not a physician, <laughs> I'd say absolutely, uh, because even if I think of what I learned in previous years, there are two angles, right? I am more empowered about questions I could ask my doctor and and also more empowered about where there are certain risk factors for me because doctors have almost targeted uh, looking at where there are holes in the existing system I think it's important for anyone working, especially, I mean, if you are in allied health, if you care about public health, like if you care about health in general, there's a lot to gain from, from this conference. Uh, but I also know that we get a couple of people who, um, they also come because they still want to be able to connect with some of the specialists for their own reasons, right? So if you are in a space where you need to connect with people in the health sector, it's a great place to go because we've, got enough years under our belt that it's 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 a good event to come to just to connect with people, right? Um, we have some people, you know, funders, sponsors, people who are coming who are not in health, but just care that much about the health sector and about physicians. Um, I think even, I remember having like people like accountants <laughs> who were interested in the conference. It's amazing how people come far and wide for the event. So I think there's value. It's no different to coming to, I guess, a general academic uh, conference in some ways, but it obviously means more, I think, for Black people, for sure. Andrew, anything you want to add for the lens of someone who's not in the profession attending and getting value? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I would certainly agree. The other thing I'd add is because um, our organization represents all physicians, so family docs, but including specialists, you know, the talks tend to be more, um, you, you know, we're not going to spend, you know, hours talking about X diabetes drug, you know, there's sort of broader topics that tend to have a public health sort of uh, perspective on it. And um, there's lots of discussion generally about, you know, things that affect, affect black people. So, you know, I, I, we, we keep it sort of, um, broader to appeal to you know a broad audience for that reason and so whether you're in medicine or not you know especially um you know and whether you're black or not right we, we can't do a lot of the work we do without allies you, you know we're 
especially as you go up the tree, you know, there's fewer of us at the top, given the, the black docs who went before people like myself, you know, they had so many other barriers that were, they helped to remove. So I was able to get to where I am. Therefore, there's fewer of them there. You know, our organization uh, going forward is going to be a very young organization. If you think now 20 black medical students per year at U of T alone, when there was one, you know, there's lots of new faces coming through. So, you know, we at the top, you know, we, we need those allies. And so we make sure that, um, yeah, you know, it's a welcoming environment for all. And certainly like th there's benefit for anyone who's interested in learning more about um, black health. Okay. As we start to uh, close down the conversation, if you had a wish list for black physicians, what are some of the things that would be on that wish list or are, are on that wish list? You first, me? <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, definitely it would be just that attaining their profession would be easier. I think there are a lot of unnecessary barriers. So that's the first. The second would be I think even support and scholarship, given the needs in the sector, I don't think, you know, they necessarily have to pay so much just to be able to, to learn in their craft. Um, and I guess I'd say the third is for them to understand that you can't give from an empty cup, you can't pour from an empty cup. So just to be able to uh, prioritize their wellness as well. I mean, I think we've put a larger focus on wellness this year um, because we know physicians are, are burnt out, but I think there's the extra added layer for a black physician as well, right? Andrew. Yeah, I would also add that last point. You know, we, we've, um, we, we've, you know, speaking to our members, we, we know how important um, wellness is, you know, all the challenges, um, through the pandemic, all the challenges that uh, folks face, you know, whether it's in the hospital or, or in clinics or otherwise. And um, yeah, we wanna be able to um, provide more opportunities to connect. Um, and then just ways to make life easier, right? Mm. You know, when I go to some of the places I work, um, and if I don't have to experience microaggressions or, you know, jump through a whole ton of hoops, it just makes that day that much easier. And so um, I think that that's some of the work we do on a systems level um, and then on an individual level as well. Um, yeah, just to make sure that, yeah, we really prioritize wellness. One last conversation piece. Uh, Shanai said, "We need resources. We need people, et cetera, et cetera." So, if you had, if you if you got everything you needed, what would be the first thing you would do as an organization? If we got everything we needed financially, or... yeah. Okay. Dream big. Okay, dream big. The first thing we do. Hmm. Well, I think. It's in process, but definitely we would roll out all of our Black Health um, Education Equity Centers in all of the mid schools. Um, we would have labs where um, immigrant and incoming physicians would also be able to practice. Um, and I think we'd try to replicate. Oh, no. I have to give that. I have to give that idea some thought. I already got greedy. I'll stop, Andrew. You can. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with being greedy? I'm saying dream big. <laughs> well, Andrew can go because he said, "What's the first thing you can do?" And I've already, I've already given two. I'll slow down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, I'd say um, we really. It'd be nice to support uh, to get more of a to really um, kind of support our organizations outside of Ontario as well. You know, okay. we are, we've been around the, the longest, you know, we're the biggest, we're still small, 
We've helped to support some of the other physician association, Black physician associations in other provinces. There is also a Black Physicians of Canada. Um, you know, we have these uh, sort of similar structures in medicine. We have the Canadian Medical Association. We have in Ontario, the Ontario Medical Association. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to these organizations, but they're big. You know, they, they, they're, they're, and, you know, there's a lot of um, collaboration, a synergy between them. You know, imagine a, a, a Canada where, you know, we had, you know, these big physician associations across the, across the country. Uh, we had, you know, tons of support and representation from this national organization. Just like if we were able to grow broadly, you know, we would rival, you know, you know, I think in the, in the States for, for what it's worth, you know, they have some of these big organizations, you know, and, you know, I think we're, we're getting there, you know, with sort of how we're, you know, growing and with our membership and our, our, our funds and support. So it'd be nice to really be able to, to, to big up all of our other uh, groups that we partner with. And I will just double up on that point that we oh, thought you were going to add another one. You're just, just going to just stay with two. I thought you're going to get greedy. Come on. <laughs> well, well, I'm being greedy now. I would Good. say within Ontario, we're we're still limited with doing a lot of our work in GTA, mainly mm-hmm. because we don't get to really be able to get, engage our members in the rest of Ontario as much as we'd like. So I would love uh, if I had an endless amount of money to be able to have little like branches out there. Um, but just to say, through Enable, we're going to try to be able to at least start that, starting little hubs of support. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very good point, Shanae, because more and more Black Canadians are living outside of the greater Halton, Toronto region. You know, there's places like Shelburne, the Niagara region, the Black po- population is rising in those areas. So being able to serve them is uh, utmost importance. Well, I'd like to say thank you to both of you and your organization for what you have done, are doing, and will be doing. It has been great. I that Before they asked me, you know, what are some of the best conversations you've done? This is a good conversation. I learned a lot. And I know our family who watch this live or listen to this on the replay have learned a lot also. So just a little bit of recap. If you want to hear more or get more information about the organization, there is a link for our press release. Also, Saturday. It's a whole pile of things going on on Saturday, by the way. If you can fit this one in, wherever you are, there's a symposium information. And I think most importantly, find out more information about BPAO. Go to their website. And not just for Saturday's event, but year-round. Really, really important. So want to thank both of you. Remember to give yourselves grace and don't just manage your time manage your energy and i'm expecting you to be back because one of the conversation topics i'd love to have both you talk about are the changes in health legislation in in ontario that are being proposed so i'm i'm expecting (laughs) you to come back to chat on that because i'm looking at both of you to be the experts from a black lens about the changes proposed changes in health care in ontario and how incredibly deep it's going to impact people who look like us. Is that fair? Anytime. All right. Thanks very much for everything. Be well and keep the faith. And I'm speaking nothing but incredible success this Saturday. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right, family. That was another epic conversation. And hey, I learned a lot. And I hope you did too. Whether you're in Ontario or not, a lot of evergreen conversation topics that are impacting black physicians and blacks, not only in Ontario, but around the world. So very, very important. So we, and also big shout out to Anita who made this conversation happen because she got the coordination of both these individuals on because they're both very busy. So big shout out to Anita to make that happen. So big shout out, big shout out. So before we close off a few things, we like to say, as always, if you want to subscribe to the Dr. Vibe Show, like to do it preferably on YouTube if you can. Subscribe on YouTube and also hit the notification bell so you get notified of upcoming epic conversations. You can like us on Facebook. Also like us on LinkedIn. Wherever you're watching, 
like it and also spread the word. Spread the word. Please do. Please do. Also, if you would like to advertise your product or service on the platform, please do that. You can contact me at this email address, dr. Period dot, dr. Period, V-I-B-E at the dr. V-I-B-E S-H-O-W dot com. Also, if you want to contact me directly, there's a number of ways. I, I say to people that I'm Googleicious. So you can contact me on the dr. V-I-B-E S-H-O-W dot com. Email dr. Period V-I-B-E at the dr. V-I-B-E S-H-O-W. Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn, The Dr. Vibe Show. Twitter, at The Dr. Vibe Show, or at Dr. Vibe Show, D-R-V-I-B-E-S-H-O-W. And Instagram, at The Dr. Vibe Show. And also, you can watch replays of this show, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, The Dr. Vibe Show, and my website address. So, as always, this is how we close up. Live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. Block assumptions, the name bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. Love, faith, and respect. And remember to give yourselves grace and don't just manage your time, manage your energy. We'll catch you soon. God bless. Peace to all. Keep the faith and walk good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.